Welcome back. Now, this particular session will attempt to get down to the nuts and bolts of where investment opportunities lie and what needs to be done to increase the attractiveness of African countries to encourage more and of the right type uh, of, of investment. Uh, in my view, in our industry, Africa and tourism will come into focus in very sharp, into very sharp focus as we emerge, hopefully, out of the pandemic crisis soon. So I think we should be talking on that level. Um, my distinguished guests bring their own specialist expertise to the discussion, particularly from the perspective of the areas of the Commonwealth and South Africa. They are Ian Middle Granger, who's uh, MP and chair of the UK Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and recently appointed vice chair of the Commonwealth. We have Mobin Rafiq, who is chairman of Falcon House Properties uh, UK and founder and CEO of the Commonwealth Entrepreneurs Club. And we'll be finding out a little bit more about that. We also have Il Ilsa uh, Van Schalkwijk, and forgive me if, if the pronunciation isn't perfect, um, the chief director for Economic Sector Support Western Cape. Uh, and we also have, um, as a last minute change, uh, Dr. Tiens Vivian, uh, thank you for stepping in, uh, who is the Head Destination Development Place at Marketing Cape Town. He's replacing uh, Alderman James Voss. Welcome to you all. Um, thanks for, uh, for um, being here. And some of those titles are quite, quite incredible, aren't they? Um, <laughs> but I want to start with Cape Town um, and with you, Ilsa, because you have some observations, don't you, to make about the investment climate at the moment, particularly as it's affecting you in South Africa and the Western Cape. Thank you very much, Rajan. So yes, um, I work for provincial government, so it's very much in terms of a regional for the Western Cape. And in terms of our experience over the last year, it's definitely been a shift with regards to the investment climate. Um, and it's not just unique to South Africa, but definitely in terms of the Western Cape perspective, what we're seeing is in terms of shifts has been the move um, from tourism being classified as a high risk investment opportunity. So businesses are currently struggling um, to access capital uh, due to the fact that the demand for the business in terms of the current ban on travel for, for um, different countries and in South Africa's uh, perspective, very much with regards to being seen as a high risk country during um, in relation to the what they refer to as the SA variant with regards to the current COVID strain has really placed a big strain on another word of strain on South Africa and our SMEs being able to access formal financing. So it's, um, and we've seen that shift over the last 12 months. Um, in the beginning, COVID, there was a lot of relief funding available to try and get businesses over that, that hump in terms of just securing their cash flow. But as the, the, the months increased and as the period um, lengthened with regards to the businesses not being able to trade because there was just not enough visitors coming to, to the Western Cape, and in the Western Cape in particular, we're quite reliant on international travel, we've seen um, a cease in relation to many commercial real estate developments. So from a construction side, there's definitely been a slowdown with regards to the activity. Um, many companies are unsure with regards to spending um, and as we go into wave, we went through wave one and two and we, we survived the second wave in South Africa pretty decently. But the third wave, of course, and that perception of risk has really placed the, and I understand that, but the financial institutions are seeing it as a, as a higher risk investment. So from a small business perspective, from a commercial, from the bigger, the larger firms, there's, there's, um, it's not as easy to raise capital, whether it's from a private equity perspective or the formal financing to, with regards to just managing and, um, your cash flow. So there's definitely been a shift in South Africa with regards to the, the availability of, of financing. When it comes to, to big finance from the international uh, sector, I mean, and private equity in particular, where, how much do you get of that, if you like? How, where does it come from in terms of, of, of the Cape, Western Cape? So in terms of that, we've got a pretty solid investment pipeline, which we, which we monitor. Um, the majority of the investment currently for tourism with regards to foreign direct investment sits um, probably in the real estate um, sector. So you would see a lot of where there's been a shift with regards to new investment, shifts are occurring in terms of expansion opportunities. And currently um, the, there wasn't too many, um, how can I say, companies that withdrew. 
they, they, they did just tentatively pause their expansion operations. So from a foreign direct investment perspective, the landscape is changing in terms of that the volume of queries, the volume of investment leads are slowing down. Um, which is a risk, and I don't think that's just in from a Western Cape or South African perspective. Um, I think that's a global shift because the risks is a similar risk that any other country or financier would consider. Um, Dr. Vivian, if I can turn to you, do you, do you echo a lot of what uh, Ilse says there? Is that the experience that you're having on, on a city level? Um, tell me what, 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 the, what the state of play is there with you. Mm. Yes, uh, Rajan, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, much in agreement, um, we an integrated city with the uh, hinterland of our province. But what we've seen is that there's great interest still in Cape Town as an investment destination. So during the pandemic 2019-2020 period, uh, we landed about 11.6 billion rand of investment in Cape Town. Now that was predominantly in manufacturing, but also very importantly in the BPO sector. So we've seen a lot of uh, call centers being erected, people working online. So the change is there, but the interest is still, is still with Cape Town. Um, we also positioned as a ICT startup hub uh, in Africa, and that's boded well for us during this period. We know it's challenging times, um, but I think the, the pre-COVID growth rate is, is waiting to, to re-emerge and we positioned quite well to, to take up those opportunities. What about hotels? What about the classic uh, travel and tourism uh, stock, if you like, that you, that you need in a city like yours? What, what's the state of play with that? Well, we have a few hotels that are in process of expanding and also new hotels being built in Cape Town. So I think people are looking at the longer play and saying there, there is opportunity in Cape Town. There were very good growth figures prior to the pandemic. But our challenge as a city government is to build uh, destination confidence. And I think that's Africa's challenge. We need to build destination confidence. Why would people come here? We know they come here for the attractions. They come here for the experience. What are the things that deter them from coming? COVID is the thing at the moment. So how do we combat that? If I'm in the destination as as a tourist and I do contract the virus, what will happen to me? Will there be sufficient facilities available? So coping with the second and the third uh, wave is crucial in building that uh, confidence for the destination. But we've bounced back uh, previously and we're confident to do that again. Well, thank you. We'll return to, to both of you and talk about the, the, the Cape and Cape Town issue and the Western Cape issue as well. Uh, I want to turn to Mobin. Now, Mobin, you have two hats, if you like. You are uh, part of an investment consortium, if that's the right word, uh, but you're also uh, the kind of head of the Commonwealth Entrepreneurs Club. So before I ask you about the Commonwealth Entrepreneurs Club, should we watch a quick video of uh, telling us a little bit about it? Hopefully it will come now.
so there we have it maybe it's it's, it's a good video it, it outlines <laughs> what the club does but I, I i need to ask you i mean some people might think the commonwealth uh, an anachronism um, perhaps not relevant to 21st century africa w what do you say to that i think uh, it is more relevant now especially after uh, uk taking a stand on brexit so now we are back into commonwealth and i think uh, another advantage is that what commonwealth used to be uh, 30 years ago but things have changed so commonwealth is not poor commonwealth is rich full of minerals resources so i think it's a, and then it's a huge population so i think uh, it is a, it is a it is a good start and uh, great expectations and uh, good timing in a sense because the industry needs collaborations industry needs uh, joint ventures so i think uh, i personally look at it it's the right time and uh, especially after this covid it becomes more because now we need to interact with each other and and commonwealth advantages we we know each other it's uh, mainly it's uh, english is, is speaking countries and uh, uh, uk is still a very big brand so i think uh, loads of smes in uk i mean the main idea of commonwealth entrepreneur club is to uh, create opportunities for smes because you know smes are very important because 80 85 percent of the uh, smes in each and any country in commonwealth consist 85 percent which is which is a big number and uh, that's where we thought but the advantage we have right now is that this time what we are trying we want to Commonwealth to take the private sector lead instead of doing concentrating, taking government, taking more uh, weight uh, through government. I think the easiest way, the only way, because you know we already tried last 30, 40, 50 years, but I personally feel that, especially my background, my family background from the industry. So I personally believe that without the private sector, we won't be able to make a headway. So now I think, uh, and I really don't need to convince because most of the important people, especially Excellency Ian Little Gretcher, you know, uh, I, I forgot to congratulate him. So I, I want to do that first. But I mean, this, this is important. So I think uh, everyone I've uh, been watching the last few years in UK is convinced that it's the private sector which has to take uh, uh, the responsibility because it, it, it's more faster. Because you see, end of the day, what happens is uh, in Commonwealth, you know, every two, three years, one year, you know, they all meet. But it's the presidents, the prime ministers, and it's the ministers. But, uh, you know, the action is in private sector. So yeah. I think uh, the idea is how do we promote private sector? That's yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, the question I want to ask you then is you, you said that the SMEs are the really important things and the, and the Commonwealth Entrepreneurs Club is there to help them. Right now, those SMEs in South Africa or wherever else are suffering. So what, what are you actually doing right now uh, in order to help that? Well, you know, I've got, I've got 40 years experience. Uh, and obviously my father was a pioneer in industry. So, but my, with my experience, I mean, I bought, during my lifetime, more than 2,000 machinery from UK and exported. And I, I, I'm very passionate about MSME. I'm passionate about SMEs. And I've got several hundred chairmen, managing directors in different parts of the world running industry. So I, this is what we have the last 40 years, you know, during my 72 countries visit. This is what I've always been talking about. To me, small is beautiful. To me, SME is beautiful, and each and every country has a different, uh, you know, SME status in their country. In, in Europe, SME means you need minimum 200 people. In UK, is different. In India, is different. Pakistan is different. Africa is different. But the thing is, SME is a backbone of any country. And now is the time because the, the infrastructure is being developed reasonably. So this is this is another very good part. And now the thing is that the people do understand that to elevate poverty, you need to create jobs. To create jobs, 
the best thing you need is you need vocational training centers. Because without vocational training center, you can't produce entrepreneurs. So to produce entrepreneurs, you need the skill development, and that's where I'm talking. So luckily, in Africa, there is, especially South Africa, this is already done very well. Nigeria is looking into it. Ethiopia is looking into it. Kenya is looking into it. So I think it's a great opportunity for UK SMEs to uh, take an advantage because they want to go out. They want to, you know, I mean, they, they, so this is where I'm trying to, with help of Ian, to bring these uh, people close. And if we could finish the red tape and uh, the opportunity which we want to create is make the Commonwealth industrialists, the private sector, sit in front of UK uh, uh, SMEs owners. That 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 will probably will uh, expedite things. Okay, we're going to develop some of that in, in the rest of the session. Let me turn to you then, Ian. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the in the minister's uh, session where. I said to you, hang on a minute, people are going to be a little bit sceptical about Britain suddenly being interested in Africa because, let's face it, a lot of uh, British money and international money has gone into Southeast Asia, for example, in the past, and less so um, when it comes to, to Africa. You may uh, want to contradict me there, but but it, what it, this just explain to me this new new interest, this new development of relations when it comes to, to Africa from the UK. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I think I can sum it up fairly simply in that myself and Mobin, um, we, we talked about this and it, it seemed the way forward is to set up an entrepreneur's club because in a way you are right. Because of the pull of Singapore, Hong Kong, as it was, um, obviously enormous interest throughout the, that part of the world. But also we, because of our relationship with Europe, which has got more complicated, um, we've really had to concentrate on probably the wrong things. We, we've now restarted and rebooted in a way and, and listening to what we've been hearing from South Africa this morning, um, it shows that there is not only a market, but there is also an absolute need because a, a weak Africa is a problem for all of us. And, and it doesn't matter which part of Africa it is. It, it, it can be South Africa, it, we've heard from Nigeria, but it can be North Africa, West and East. Every part we need to look at. And I think this is where, as an entrepreneurs club, we're bringing together people, and Mobin has done a phenomenal job in a very short time, in saying to people, well, we can change it. The other thing is that, the, you know, the City of London is led, by, is a market-driven um, organisation, and it is a massive resource. And one of the things we want to do is to, is to say to them that we've got all these SMEs right, Africa. They are, by and large, very well run. They have accountancy, legal, everything else that we basically recognise at every level. Um, you're not within the auspices of governments most of the time, which is where people get a little bit nervous, especially with certain governments. And therefore we can invest. And I think what we've got to look at, and um, Dr. Sian has actually sort of brought the point up about, about the, the money following. And I think where we are with market forces at the moment, this pandemic is going to take us some time to come out of this. There's no shadow of a doubt. Uh, the, the, the problems we've got with vaccines, the problems we have with just, um, dare I say, it, that people are nervous. Mm. So as I think, Roger, what we've got to say to people is, look, there's an opportunity. We need to build up our resources to say, you, you don't just have to look at the Americas or South America. There is this entire continent, which is open for business, always has been. And I think... Um, for whatever our history may be, Britain is very well placed to try and help in that. And I think we can help in that. So if we can in, in, in Britain in any small way, influence the city of London, and by doing that, you tend to influence the Americans as well, who can be very jaundiced about South Africa. They, they don't quite understand it. They, they, they remember it from the days of sort of, um, you know, problems in, in Namibia and problems in Rhodesia as it was and as in Zimbabwe, obviously. And, th and they tend to look at it through a prism. And if we can break that prism down so that they say, oh, yes, actually, yes, this is a good place to do business. We can do it via London or New York. Then I think we can do that. But SME is the lifeblood of any economy, Raj, as you know, Raj, as you know. No, no more so than Africa, where SMEs start from literally nothing. And, and they suddenly build up into these incredible conglomerates. And if we can help in that, then we should. So, you know, it, it is a partnership. This is all partnership working. 
And, 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 and I think what holds us together is this funny old history that we have where there is a sort of family feeling that, oh, yeah, why shouldn't we help? We can help. And that, but that doesn't preclude parts of Africa that, we, that, that don't speak English, Chad, Niger, um, the, the, what I call that sort of Western part. Um, and, and we can do that. I mean, our history with Morocco, which has never been part of any, of any else with us, is 800 years old, trading. And we are very close. And again, that's just one example of what we're yeah. doing. So what you're saying is you're not precluding uh, dealing <clears throat> with non-Anglophone, for example, non-Commonwealth countries in the future. I mean, because all the talk that I've heard as well has been all about much more of an African Union. You know, th th there's all sorts of economic initiatives going on, the continental yep. free trade area, all that stuff is very much about Africa and looking self, being more self-sufficient, being more together and coordinated. Does a Commonwealth body get in the way of that anyway? Is it, how, does, how does that coordinate? Well, th that's a very good point, actually. The answer is no, I don't think it does. What we try and do is we complement, because we've got, the thing about the Commonwealth, we, we've, we've always had the political side, that's always been there. And that's heads of government, speakers, uh, parliamentarians from across the Commonwealth. What we want to do is to bring in the other still, which is basically the business side. And that's where Mobin comes in. And it's not part of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, nothing to do with it, but I personally think it's an important part of what we're trying to do. Now, we have a very close affinity with the Francophonie countries, which is obviously the French old countries from, uh, from uh, within Paris. And we, we do work very well together, Roger. But I think this, this has got to be much bigger than just isolated ideas. But if you've got one thing that you can carry forward using that, we will do that. And I, I, and I really think we can do something very, very special. And South Africa is such a sort of orbit that um, utilising the, you know, the experiences of, of Cape Town and right across that, that region is incredibly important. And we have got an ongoing situation in Mozambique that has got to be resolved because it, if you don't, you just know what's going to happen. We've seen it in our lifetime, all of us, before in, in Africa. Um, and we don't want that happening again because you, everybody wants to have, see prosperity, successful, vibrant countries which are being properly backed and properly funded. I mean, just to concord with what you're saying, I mean, it's, you know, there is the old adage that, um, you know, that Africa is, is, is got a young demography, it's amazingly labour rich, if you like, but capital poor, which is the Western world, which is uh, ageing, uh, capital rich, and in a sense, labour poor or in the future. And we, we need much more collaboration. So that's obviously going to be important. But in terms of how you see things at the moment, Right now, we have a kind of stasis where nothing is really going on. What, what can the Commonwealth do right now to, to encourage and, and boost investment? Well, I, I'm going to sort of come back to where Mobin's involved, if I may, is that the, one of the things that we set out to do is to bring people, not just from Commonwealth countries, a lot of Middle East um, people who we worked in partnership for generations, but we're trying to bring them together so that we can say, right, we've got this broad spectrum of people. So if there's an opportunity, so um, we'll take Nigeria just for instance, then we can say, look, there is this opportunity. This can be done. The City of London, New York Stock Exchange, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, let's see if we can get the funding together to do it. The other point that may be made was, is learning and skills, because that is actually absolutely crucial. It, 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 it can be any uh, tourism, anything. It, it's, people have got to be trained. And to do that, we have to be able to get training that is right for that country. And one of the things that the Commonwealth are trying to do is set up an academy that we will then bring young people, get that opportunity to do it. But you can only do so much. What we've got to try and do is also get that skill set within country. Now, that can be done through, uh, in the United Kingdom, it would be universities or what we call tertiary colleges, further education colleges, which are world renowned. And therefore we try and get them to take that on. So if we can do both sides using the Entrepreneurs Club, using government, using the country's resources, and all countries have good resources, to bring that together, then I think Roger, we do have the basis of um, a very interesting future. And remember, we're coming out of the worst pandemic that we have in, in our lifetime, but since 1922, when we had the flu pandemic. Um, which didn't affect a lot of countries. This has affected every single country in the world. Uh, and therefore, everybody's got to come out as close as we can together um, with, a, with what I would call, you know, a hope for the future. 
Thank you. We'll come back to you. Um, let's just go back to, to South Africa um, and, and to you, Ilsa. I, I was interested in, in what Mobin was saying about the private sector being really the way forward and not through government. How do you feel about that? With regards to what um, public funds is not, uh, we've seen definitely a shrink in terms of our fiscal purse. Um, and the, it's definitely has to be public led, oh, excuse me, private sector led with regards to raising capital. Um, I think that there's been a definitely being a big call. One of our funds that uh, is currently being rolled out in South Africa is called the Tourism Equity Fund, which is a, it's more of a, let's say, a public private partnership. Um, in relation to companies that are uh, for previously disadvantaged individuals to apply the majority um, to buy either shares in a company or in its, in its gear towards tourism businesses. So it's to enable and kickstart that funding process with regards to either people that want to buy a share in a business or invest into a sustainable, profitable business idea. So I think there's, a, there's, there's room where government needs to enter the fray, but if we don't have more of these public-private partnerships with a uh, private sector, um, we're not going to do the need that ne get the necessary impact that we need to just bring a bit of stability with regards to in, in specifically with regards to tourism. And um, Ian also mentioned something which is quite imperative: is if we look at Africa as a whole and the the role of of um, travel and trade. Uh, whether it's through the Continental Free Trade Agreement, whether it's through air connectivity. Mm. Um, if we don't, because that's one of the big focus we've got from South Africa side is to increase the, the trading activities, which also has an impact on travel um, industries into Africa and into the regions. So there's definitely a symbiotic relationship that, that we have to pursue with regards to mm. travel and trade and um, investing into the right sort of catalysts like air connectivity, which we've seen in the past, we've done so heavily over the last four years, just to get more international flights into Cape Town um, and the Western Cape. And that's had a huge impact on our tourism industry. And of course, then your business um, travel and your, your other industries. And now it's spinning off into cargo opportunities. So the, the tourism, and that's the one thing with regards to the tourism industry, it plays such a critical connect yeah. like a connected economy role um mm. and i think the world is seeing that and the lack of that um travel that's happening yeah. if i can go to you uh, uh, dr Vivian, in terms of the, the vocational training and skills that Mobin and, and uh, Ian were both talking about there um how much is, is that needed right now in in cape town or do you have do you surely not have the facilities there the, the, the education and the colleges there that can do that uh, we do have a very good network of uh, universities and colleges in Cape Town. Um, we pride ourselves on being a close proximity to four major universities in the city of Cape Town. Um, and training is, is high on our agenda. But a word of caution, I see in many economies, the first um, reaction is to train more tourist guides. And there's an abundance of tourist guides that sit without work in many places all over the world due to the pandemic. So we need to be selective in what kind of training we want to do and for what are the future jobs that we, we foresee. But there's another aspect which I think uh, we, we need to touch on and that is the international law and legislation in and around risk mitigation. Um, we came unstuck in, in South Africa and in Cape Town with the interpretation of uh, force majeure which was not acknowledged by insurance companies in the same manner as the, um, the shareholders of the companies. So uh, I think in many cases, we, we saw uh, hopeful uh, SMMEs who said, I have a policy, I've paid for many years. This is force majeure, I need to be paid out and insurance companies had a different opinion. I think we need to address that throughout Africa, uh, risk sharing, risk mitigation with tour operators, big tour operators, operators they all say if I if I back the small guy uh, my risk goes through the roof so I stick to the the companies I know and those are the old and the bigger companies so we're trying to to break that down we've had uh, many webinars in providing that information uh, to the industry and then I also think we need to to be cognizant of the the need for resilient cities investors make decisions based on stability and security 
And if we as local government, regional, national governments, all work together to provide stability in terms of infrastructure, in terms of policies, sound policies, clean government, which Cape Town prides itself on, uh, then we've got a great future together. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a question for the audience, which I think, which I think I'm going to direct to you, Mobin, as an in, as an, uh, an investor, if you like. Which is uh, the question is, what do you think about investment uh, for the West African coast, especially Sierra Leone, which holds 460 kilometres of coastline? Have all the of all this has all this potential um, been fully developed yet? What do you, what do you think? That have you thought about that area? I think uh, you know uh, before I. Uh, uh, give him a reply. There are two things I want to discuss. One is, and that is again going back to the investment. So uh, I think a couple of years ago, I had attended a very uh, expensive and a very decent public-private partnership uh, conference in London. And uh, so I was able to meet probably 150 uh public-private partners, experts. So this was probably one of the best conference I, I've ever attended. And you won't believe it. It was a, it was a three days conference. And uh, my question, my confusion was that what is the minimum cost? What is the minimum cost of a public-private partnership? Now, this was a confusion. I had asked this question from so many experts in UK. So in this conference, when it started, in the first question answer session, instead of asking a question with the panel, I asked this question with the whole audience. And I said, guys, I hope you don't mind. Just let me know what is the minimum cost of a PPP. And you won't believe it for, for 30, 40 seconds, it was quiet. And then all of a sudden, I heard somebody said $100 million then somebody said 70, 30, 40, 50. And during the three days, I became a celebrity. Everybody approached me. They said, don't worry, we can even do it $20 million. So this is a confusion I'm showing. When you talk about, I just wanted to <laughs> explain this. When you talk about public-private partnership, people just think, oh, you talk. But in SMEs, we don't need hundreds of millions of dollars. We need $10 million. $20 million, or you can have three separate projects and we can, you know, so, so in a sense, there's a great opportunity that it is misconstrued for people to understand what is PPP, because the moment you talk about PPP, they just say you're talking about $500 million, $300 million. So, so this is what, now going back to that, that look, second thing is that in our with Ian, what we have done, we discussed this topic. In Commonwealth Entrepreneur Club, biggest difference is that this time, we are inviting the other countries outside Commonwealth that please do business with us. Now, as an entrepreneur, as an industrialist, as an in you know, technocrat and social entrepreneur, I read people's mind, I talk to them, in the last my 40 years, I've, I've seen one thing that uh, people wants to move forward, but the biggest problem is finding a good partner. Now, what we are doing in Commonwealth Entrepreneur Club is that we are trying to find good partners. For example, in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, people are desperately looking for African market. But the biggest problem is that when they go to Africa, they have a shock of their life because end of the day, they end up with the wrong partners. So they have not done their homework properly. You see? So finding, so this is where we are coming into the picture, where we are trying to create an awareness that, okay, I can get you a good partner. So I think this is a win-win situation that in a sense, from London, we are helping people to find good partners. And maybe we also can collaborate with them. So I think this is probably going to uh, uh, give an answer to the gentlemen that we are there. We are there to help everyone. It's not that, you know, we are we are we we want to help the whole 54 countries. But on top of that, we want to help the global countries as well to come and work with us 
and we'll find you good partners to collaborate with. Okay, so to answer that question, yes, you would be looking at Sierra Leone, for example. You would be encouraging members of yes. the club to look yes. to there as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Okay, there's so much we more, more we could talk about. I wanted to talk about female entrepreneurship. I wanted to talk about technology, fintech. There's so much more in this category. Again, I go back to this point. When we all meet in person, which could even be in September uh, in Cape Town, I hope that we can all sit around a table and discuss these things in so much more detail. But gentlemen, and, and, and Ilsa, thank you very much indeed for joining us for this session. Um, please hang around. Now, coming up, we have uh, a panel on resilience with uh, a big friend of the ITIC, uh, um, Edmund Bartlett, uh, hosting. So um, stick around for that. See you soon. <laughs>